If I was to ask you, what does the Lord God require of you? Would you know where to look? Yeah, I know in the Bible, but where about in the Bible? Because I don't think he requires anything different from anybody else that is a part of his kingdom, but the same thing. So let's look and see what God required back then, and let's see if we can identify what he requires now. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12, now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Did he change that in any way when he came to the New Testament? I don't think so. But let's pray and then we'll take a look at Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. But let's pray. Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you again because whatever you require of us, you're there to help us deliver what you required. Father, that tells me that you are an awesome God and that you are concerned about us, your people. Now, Father, let us see what you require of saints in the New Testament. And we will give you praise and glory. We ask you things in Jesus' name. Amen. The reason I want to come to Matthew 25 because this is Matthew presenting Jesus a king and Matthew has come all the way and tracked Jesus' life to now he comes down to rewards, come down to judgment. And in verse chapter 25 and uh 31, he begins to make some tremendous statements so we can get some idea of what is God requiring of thee. Now, remember what it was in the Old Testament, that you fear the Lord, walk in all his ways, love him, and serve him. But in Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31, he says this, and he's bringing people before him. He says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nation will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God provided, prepared this for you and I from the foundation of the world. Now, listen what he's doing. He's, he put the goats on the left and the sheep on the right. But then he says to the sheep, and then he's going to turn around and say something to the goats. We are the sheep of his pasture. He is our shepherd. And so here the saints are standing at the end of, of Matthew 25 and then the king says to them on his right he said for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink I was a stranger 
and you invited me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invited you in or naked and clothed you? He answers, when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? He answered, the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And now he's going to do the same thing with the goats and look like the same criteria is before them what they did not do. They didn't uh, feed him when he was hungry. They didn't give him something to drink when he was thirsty. And he's talking about one key ingredient, and that's love. So two things that he requires of us that's not really any difference from, he re, uh, from what he required from Israel to walk in his ways, to fear him, to walk in his ways, to love him, and serve him. Here, he said, whatever you've done to the least, that's what you've done to me, and that's love. Love is not what you say. It's what you do. So the two things that's, that must mark our life is the, uh, the uh, love for one another and the keeping of his commandments. You know, I just saw something. What I just saw was in Matthew 22, he said in around about verse 37, a lawyer came to him and said, which commandment is the greatest? And Jesus turned and says to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind, all your soul and all your strength. And love thy neighbors thyself. And on these two hinge all the laws and all the prophets. So he just said the same thing. When you love God and you love people, you meet the qualification. Because when you love God, that means you are right with God. You, you, you are keeping his commandments. He made this statement. He says, uh, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And that's what they were doing. So he, and then the other thing is, that's righteousness. But then the other thing was love thy neighbors thyself. Now, I want to go to Revelation. I don't mean Revelation. I mean First John. Uh, First John. And look at chapter 3 and verse 10. He says, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. That's the two things again. One is your obedience to God. That's righteousness. And then your acts of love, that is the, the, like the second commandment. So it moved. And so it really comes back to you keeping the commandments by loving God. You love God by keeping his commandments. Then you keeping the commandments because you loving your neighbor as yourself. So that's what is required of us. But the good news is that God is the one that has given us his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit 
produces in us the fruits of the Spirit, which is love, joy, patience. All, all this is love, and that's how we love one another. So, beloved, as, as we look at this season, the thing is, God has not changed anything. The same thing he required from Israel being in the kingdom, fear the Lord, walk in his ways, love him, serve him. It's the same thing we do in the kingdom, which is the realm of salvation. So when we function in the realm of salvation, we literally are pleasing him and we benefiting others. So what we have to do is say, how do we do that? And basically, you got to come to the word of God again. And in the word, it's going to tell you how to love and how to make those sacrifices. In fact, uh, uh, verse chapter 4 of First John, he says, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because great is he that's, who is in you than he who is in the world. And if you would drop down to verse 7, this is what it's going to say. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifest in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, that's what Christianity is all about. Is loving God and loving people. And if we're doing that, God says, that's your evidence that you are in God and God is in you. Because God is love. And now he's produced us to love. Beloved, let's pray and thank God that he's already worked it out. And all we got to do is walk it out. Father, I want to thank you, praise you, wish you can adore you. Father, we can't do nothing without you. So, Father, bless us to love you more and love our neighbors more, uh, uh, also so that we can please you in our walk, in our talk, in our character, and in our conduct. And we love you and we praise you. We thank you. We ask you things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.